Vice-Chancellor, honoured guests, graduands, ladies and gentlemen, I now call upon Professor Claire Ozan, Principal of Heathrock College. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, it is my pleasure on behalf of my colleagues, the governors and staff of Heathrock College to welcome you, our graduating students, members of your families and your friends, to our celebration this afternoon. I would like to extend an especially warm welcome to Professor Peter Copeman, Vice-Chancellor of the University of London, who I invite to speak to us now. Principal, graduands, ladies and gentlemen, as Vice-Chancellor of the University of London, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you all here to join today's celebration of achievement and success. As many of you will know, Un University of London is a federation of 18 of the most distinguished research and specialist higher education institutions in London. And the university is proud to have had Heathrock as one of its members. It is with sadness, but with great honour, that I'm presiding over the last graduation ceremony for Heathrock College. The association between Heathrock and the University of London originates from the time when Queen Victoria, with considerable foresight, granted the university its charter in 1863 enabling it to award degrees to students external to the central university. Your predecessor college, located in Stonyhurst, Lancashire, was thereby recognised to prepare students for University of London degrees in theology and philosophy. As you will be aware, Heathrock moved to London in 1970 and in 1971, a royal charter was established for it to become a college of the university with a mission to offer its students an education marked by intelligence, scholarship and generosity of spirit. Appropriate words to commence today's ceremony and to remind you that our graduates today join the alumni of the University of London and thus begin a lifelong association with the university. The Central University continues to contribute to our collective national and international standing through the School of Advanced Studies, the Senate House Libraries and the University of London worldwide. The volume of our academic activity is quite staggering. In addition, to the 130,000 students at the member institutions physically here in London, there are a further 52,000 students in 180 countries around the world studying externally for the University of London degree. And for a further perspective on the scale of our activity, this, this Senate House building contains 4 million books 70,000 journal titles and 12 million historical materials relating to the arts, humanities and social sciences. These titles have been further enriched by the transfer of Heathrop's library to Senate House. Undoubtedly, such volumes will continue to attract readership and respect in their new home. There is much we should honour at a time when national, political and media preoccupation is focused on the B word, Brexit. It is even more important that we all argue for and celebrate the importance of universities and of learning and scholarship. Of course, universities do contribute directly to the economy through graduates with high-level skills that underpin business and industry in sectors such as manufacturing and the life sciences and creative industries. 
But civilised society likewise requires critical intelligence that questions and challenges the status quo and respects and nurtures individual and societal inquiry. Reflect also on the other major societal challenges facing us well beyond Brexit, ageing and well-being, global security, sustainable energy resources, the impact of the digital economy, and importantly, food and water security. Responding to these challenges involves a complex mix of technical and human, behavioural, societal and legal understanding and an understanding of individual and social behaviour. In addition to responding to externally defined challenges, our graduates should be encouraged to perform the vital task of defining and exploring new areas of challenge, new interfaces of knowledge, inventing new paradigms, in short, thinking out of the box, bringing something creative minds both within and outside the conventional academic framework. And I'm certain our today's graduates are well prepared for this. And all this in the context of an increasingly diverse society, which in turn presents increasing human challenges in understanding and welcoming diversity at both individual and group level. One of the great virtues of our universities is that they provide both an intellectual and a living community experience that contributes significantly to that required tolerance and understanding and helps shape the ethical lives of the next generations of leaders. In this respect, you will all know how well Heathrop has excelled. And this is represented today by our graduates and our honorary graduates. So this is a historic and special occasion. Historic because of its finality. Special, of course, for those of you graduating. It marks the end of an important phase of your lives and celebrates your achievements. And special, too, for families and friends who have shared with you and supported you on the journey to this point. My congratulations again on behalf of the University of London to all of you whose achievements are being recognised and honoured today. And finally, I express on behalf of the University its sincerest thanks to Heathrop College for the past and good wishes for the future to all within the Jesuit society. Thank you. I now call upon Professor Claire Ozan to address the audience. I will begin by congratulating you, our graduating students, on your achievements, which we are very proud to celebrate with you today. Whether you have just completed your undergraduate degree, your master's or your doctoral studies, you will have worked very hard indeed to get to this point. Those of you who've been part-time students have had to balance your commitment to study with your responsibility at home, in ministry or in the family. Those of you who have completed a full-time course have often combined your studies with a job and with internships to position yourselves well in the employment market. There will have been moments, I am sure, when you have felt like giving up. But you have fought through and worked hard to reach this point. You should all be very proud of what you have achieved. This dedication will put you in very good stead for the future. Many of you will not have achieved this all by yourself. You will have had the support from families, partners and friends. And today is a moment for us all to extend our thanks to them too. I would also like to thank Ms. Annabel Clarkson and her team Ms Binda Rai and her team and our hosts at the University of London for their expert preparation and management of this celebration. 
It is the sincere hope of all of us at Heathrop that you have benefited from our community of learning. We hope that you have caught some of our passionate belief in the value of the subjects we teach for individuals and wider society. A couple of years ago, a career survey told us almost two thirds of our leavers pursue further study or enter or return to the people professions, teaching, ministry, healthcare, social care, and third sector charity work. This is a proud record for a college such as ours. But whatever you choose to do next, it is altogether likely that because of your studies here, you will bring to your work a creative, critical and reflective mind and that generosity of spirit of which our mission statement speaks. The words that John Henry Newman used in his discourse on the idea of a university in 1852 might well be spoken by any advocate of such a university education today. I quote, if then a practical end must be assigned to a university course, I say it is that of training good members of society. It is the education which gives someone a clear, conscious view of their own opinions and judgments, a truth in developing them, an eloquence in expressing them, and a force in urging them. Heathrop's mission is underpinned by our commitment to the ideals of Jesuit education, the care of the person and a personal approach to learning, and is possible in part because the Society of Jesus has so generously resourced us. Even more so it is made possible by the generous service offered routinely by our academic and support staff who embody Heathrop's Jesuit vision, and today I would like to thank them all on your behalf for the great many hours that they have given to make this remarkable personal education available to you, an education of high quality. The importance and quality of what we offer is underlined not only in student surveys, but by the many comments we receive from our former students. Some recent ones, uh, I'll, I'll quote, Heathrock has an inspiring vision of deeply rooted openness. The standard of the theology department is second to none. The value of Heathrop is inestimable. The staff and students of Heathrop have made an enormous contribution to the intellectual life and the life of the church in this country in a number of ways. Through the distinctive way in which we bring theology into dialogue with philosophy and philosophy into dialogue with theology through the provision of ministerial training in a university context, and through the resources we provide from the Catholic tradition for those of other Christian denominations, of other faiths and of no faith, and the personal approach to education. It is with great sadness, therefore, that we have moved now into the final few weeks of Heathrock College. The orange of the or origins of the college, as the Vice-Chancellor mentioned, lie in 1614 in Louvain in ben Belgium. Heathrop claims to be and is the oldest college of the Federal University of London, which it joined as a constituent college in 1971, but having been able to avoid, uh, uh, award University of London degrees since 1840. The college moved to Great Britain during the French Revolution, its activities initially split between Stonyhurst in Lancashire and St Bino's in Denbyshire, North East Wales, before coming together in 1926 at Heathrop Hall in Oxfordshire. At this point, the college was also awarding degrees from the Jesuit Pontifical Gregorian University in Rome. Heathrop moved to London and then to Kensington in 1993. In January 2014, the college formed the Bellamine Institute in order to make ecclesiastical awards with, awards with degree, decrees from the Holy See. And in June 2014, Heathrop College celebrated the 400th anniversary of its foundation. There is no doubt that the academic staff of Heathrop have made an extraordinary contribution to their disciplines and to society through their scholarship and public square work. 
In the most recent national research assessment exercise, 62% of research at Heathrock was rated internationally excellent or world leading. The quality of the impact of our research on society was particularly commended and was stronger than that in the University of Oxford submission. Heathrock scholars have produced groundbreaking work. Cockleston's History of Philosophy, Robert Murray's work on the Syriac Fathers, and Jack Marney's seminal work on the history of moral theology, for example. Since the year 2000, the turn of the millennium, staff at Heathrop have published more than 120 major monographs and well over 500 articles on topics ranging from analytic theology to Wittgenstein to the early councils of the church and liberation theology. Colleagues have contributed to debate in areas such as the Epistles of Paul and the Book of Revelation, the spirituality of St. Teresa and St. John of the Cross, the image of Christianity in modern Islamic thought, religion, reason and science, ethics and psychoanalysis, religious pluralism and interreligious dialogue, anti-realism and expansive naturalism, Christ in the context of climate change, respect for the dignity of the vulnerable and the value of toleration. Their research has had significant impact outside the academic sphere in the development of interreligious engagement and of new forms of religious expression and on the ethics of finance and business. And we celebrated these contributions in our final conference in July this year. In the same period since 2000, over 1,700 undergraduates 2,300 master's students and 75 doctoral students have graduated from Heathrop, joining the workforce and contributing to communities all over the UK and beyond. Following the announcement to close, we have very much appreciated the expressions of support received both in the press and by individuals, and we continue to work with the Society of Jesus in planning how to continue its tradition of scholarship and engagement with higher education through the intellectual apostolate. We are truly grateful for the contributions you have made to the life of the college. Our student union has been greatly enriched by the time you've given to organise its many societies and clubs. Our work this year to ensure we have offered you a high standard of services the college winds down would not have been possible without the time you put into focus groups and liaison committees. Along with the Heathrop staff and alumni, you now embody the legacy of the college, with its significant impact on the academy and society worldwide. And we strongly encourage you to keep in touch with us, with one another, through the Heathrop Association as you move into the next phase of your life. I'll just conclude with some words from Pope Francis in his speech to the youth. Each son or daughter of a given country has a mission, a personal and social responsibility. So I urge you then to go forward and take up your mission. Many congratulations and thank you. The presentation of graduands will now commence. I therefore call upon the principal, Professor Claire Ozan. Vice Chancellor, I beg leave to present the following graduands. Graduands awarded the Bachelor of Arts in Philosophy. Georgia Henderson. Giovanni Scotti. <laughs> Caterina Zacharias awarded first class honours.
Graduands awarded the Bachelor of Arts in Philosophy, Religion and Ethics, Shuli Begum. Llewellyn Rees. Daniel Pazia. <laughs> Olivia Murphy. <laughs> Graduands awarded the Bachelor of Arts in Philosophy and Theology. Edgar Ter Denielan awarded first class honours. <laughs> Graduands awarded the Bachelor of Arts in Theology. Thomas Millman awarded with first class honours. Graduand awarded the Diploma of Higher Education in Theology, Oliver Delaghi. <laughs> Graduands awarded the Bachelor of Divinity. Mark Dunglinson awarded with first class honours. Aidan O'Kane. <laughs> Graduands awarded the Master of Arts in Abrahamic Religions. Leonard Brown. Vanessa Goodwin, awarded with distinction. <laughs> Catherine Harris. <laughs> Catherine Mitchell. Christopher Swift, awarded with distinction. <laughs> Graduands awarded the Master of Arts in Biblical Studies. Etukudo Bassi. <laughs> Jude Ifeora. Deep Jassel. <laughs> Miriam Piplica de Davich. Graduands awarded the Master of Arts in Christian Spirituality, Alex Barrow. <laughs> Joanna Gallant. <laughs> Anne-Marie O'Reardon.
Helen Orchard awarded with distinction. <laughs> Graduands awarded the Master of Arts in Christian Theology. Sonia Gable. Eva Jedut. <laughs> Sylvia MacDonald. <laughs> Kathleen Taylor. Delia Walsh. <laughs> Graduands awarded the Master of Arts in Christianity and Interreligious Relations. Gada Haddad. Hans Sen. <laughs> Graduands awarded the Master of Arts in Contemporary Ethics, Fiona Bacon. Graduands awarded the Master of Arts in Philosophy. Fergus Cronin Coltsman. <laughs> Madeline Gordon. <laughs> William Howard. Graduands awarded the Master of Arts in Philosophy and Religion, Trevor Smith. <laughs> Graduands awarded the Master of Arts in Philosophy in Education, Stephen Mepham, awarded with distinction. Graduands awarded the Master of Theology, Julianne Bullman. <laughs> Laura Hill, awarded with distinction. David Dale. <laughs> Jessica Hazrati, awarded with distinction. <laughs> Rosalind Jansen, awarded with distinction. Michael O'Boy, awarded with distinction. <laughs> Martha Rumian. <laughs> Daniel Thompson.
Master of Arts in Philosophy, Christopher Page Tickle. Graduands awarded the Doctor of Philosophy with a thesis entitled Evil and Philosophical Anthropology, a case for rethinking the relation between the symbolic language of evil and human capability, supervised by Dr. Peter Gallagher, Marius Ban. with a thesis entitled Paul Claudel, Apostle of the Imagination, an exploration of the significance of his writing for the post-Vatican II Catholic Church, with particular focus on his universal vision. Supervised by Dr. Peter Gallagher, Andrew Bayes. <laughs> with a thesis entitled Re-evaluating the relationship between Christian salvation event and history of religion's sacrifice, an appraisal of the theological options, supervised by Dr. Michael Kerwin, Leslie Good. with a thesis entitled, Two Minds of One Faith, The Parallel Contributions of John Henry Newman, 1801 to 1890, and Joseph Ma Zhangbo, 1840 to 1939, to the cause of revealed religion, reflected in their works on revelation, conscience, the church, and education. Supervised by Dr. Michael Lang, Cyril Law. <laughs> that concludes the award of degrees. We will now have a musical interlude featuring Benny Vernon, Ben Hume, and Thomas Freeman Atwood from the Royal Academy of Music. Following this interlude, we will continue with awarding this year's college fellowships and honorary degrees.
Vice-Chancellor, Chair of Governors, Principal, ladies and gentlemen, it has been the custom for many years to confer honorary Heathrop College fellowships to individuals in recognition of their distinguished and dedicated service and support. This year, the Academic Board and the Governors have chosen to award 13 fellowships to Father Michael Holman of the Society of Jesus, the former Principal of Heathrop, to lay and independent Governors of the College for the academic year 2018-19, and to three members of Heathrop Academic and Administrative Staff for significant and dedicated service over many years. So first of all, I now call upon Professor John Davis to give the oration for Father Michael Holman. It gives me very great pleasure to present to you Father Michael Holman for admission as a Fellow of Heathrow College of the University of London. <clears throat> Michael will be well known to us all, given his contribution over many years, both to the Society of Jesus and the education sector within the United Kingdom. He arrived as Principal of Heathrop following a distinguished career in the Society of Jesus, which he joined in 1974 and was ordained as a priest in 1988. He was Headmaster of Wimbledon College, a very large eminent secondary school from 1995, where his passion for helping the marginalised and for transforming young lives through the medium of Christian education found profound expression and created lasting impact. He was appointed provincial of the British Jesuits in 2005 and served for eight years in this role where his primary concerns were developing policies and attendant activities to combat the relentless march of the secular society based on the central focus of faith in Christ. Among his initiatives here was his vision in espousing online technology for the purposes of prayer and the association with the Jesuit, uh, sorry, the Jesuit refugee service to this end. Moving from these roles to the principalship of a university institution, Heathrop College, represented a very steep learning curve on which he embarked with characteristic dedication, open-mindedness, vision and discernment. And this at a very critical time in the college's history, as we know. At all times in his stewardship of Heythrop was evidenced his commitment to the care and transformation of students, to the well-being of staff, to the academic and practical contribution of theology and philosophy, to the understanding and resolution of societal challenges. This was an affirmation of his belief in the centrality of the importance of higher education, making significant impacts both on individuals and society. It's very ironic that at the time where, under his leadership, Heythrop's demise was a serious possibility, it was arguably at its high point in terms of its academic excellence and its public regard. He was untiring in his strenuous and creative efforts to secure a sustainable partnership with a number of universities in order to guarantee the college's survival. Unfortunately, all these regretfully came to no avail, owing to external circumstances beyond his control, of which we are all aware. <clears throat> Since the closer decision became inevitable, Michael was succeeded by Professor Claire Ozan, and in his new role with the Society, has devoted much of his time to the reconceptualization of the Society's intellectual apostolate, without, of course, the historic core of Heythrop College at its heart. Uh, the governing body, the Heythrop Association of Alumni and Staff, and the Students' Union have together been active in thinking uh, this through with him in terms of what we've called the so-called Heythrop legacy. This has evolved innovative thinking along several practical dimensions which the society is espousing. These include the Mount Street Jesuit Centre, 
the Laudatis C Research Institute at Campion Hall, and finding a home for the Haythrop Library and the Haythrop Journal. The point about this, I think, is that the spirit, ethos, and operating principles of this unique institution of Haythrop do not pass into the mists of antiquity. As a former public orator in another university, it's been evident to me that there is a very fine line between the contents of an obituary and the contents of a citation. <laughs> For the former, the obituary, there is really nothing more to add. That is it. For the latter, the citation, there is the expectation that very much more is still to come and to celebrate. And this will certainly be the case with Michael, as his current initiatives will surely bear huge fruit uh, in the years before us. His massive contribution to Haythrop and what it stands for thus lives on. And with this in mind, may I request you, as Chair of the Governing Body, on the authority of the Board, to admit Father Michael Holman as a Fellow of Haythrop College of the University of London. <laughs> I now call upon Professor Claire Ozan to award the remaining fellowships and to Dr. Michael Kerwin to announce their names. Mr. John Darley. <laughs> Professor John Davis. Mrs. Tamsin Eastwood. <laughs> Mr. Michael Egan. <laughs> Mr. Jeremy Heap. Mr. Lachlan Hickey. In absentia, Dr. Edo Mani. <laughs> Professor John Morrill. Mr. John Ward. <laughs> Reverend Professor Michael Barnes, SK. Ms. Adele Clarkson. <laughs> Reverend Dr. Peter Gallagher, SJ. That concludes the awarding of the College Fellowships. Vice-Chancellor, Chair of Governors, Principal, colleagues, graduates and guests, it's my pleasure and privilege on behalf of the Principal 
and governors of Heathrop College to ask the Vice-Chancellor to admit to the degree of Doctor of Divinity of the University of London honoris causa, Professor Eamon Duffy, Emeritus Professor of the History of Christianity at the University of Cambridge, and Emeritus Fellow and former President of Magdalen College. Mrs. Janet Grafius, Curator of Collections and Historic Libraries at Stonyhurst College, Lancashire. Mr. Brian Pierce, Founder and former Director of the Interfaith Network for the United Kingdom. But first I call upon Professor Richard Price. Mr. Vice-Chancellor, you are perhaps surprised to find that Professor Eamon Duffy is being presented by Heathrop College to you with a recommendation that we should bestow on him the single honour of being a Doctor of Divinity Honoris Causa of our university. For you may well say to yourself, as I say to myself, did, why did we not bestow this honour many years ago? For Professor Duffy has for many years now, decades even, been one of the most acclaimed and influential historians of Christianity in this country. Now, his prime area of research, as you, Vice Chancellor, will be as well aware as the rest of us, has been the history of Catholicism, of Catholic practice and devotion in this country in the late Middle Ages and during the period of the Reformation. Earlier views presented this as a period of decadence in English Christianity, which was simply ripe for the Reformation. And I'm afraid it is true to say that when the Society of Jesus appeared on the scene, its advocates were happy to agree with that, to agree that until the Jesuits appeared, indeed the Catholic Church was in a decadent condition. But Professor Duffy has shown through immensely detailed and careful study of primary sources that the picture is quite different, that this age was a period when in fact English Christianity was perhaps at its most flourishing. The implication of that is that the uh, triumph of Protestantism in this country was due to state imposition, to state power. Well, of course, initial reactions to Professor Duffy's work were that this was, ah, this is an Irish Catholic playing the party line. But that position could not be maintained because of the depth of Professor Duffy's scholarship and because of the manifest fact that what really motiv motivated him was not loyalty to the Catholic Church of his childhood and his rest of his life, but respect for the solid, regular practice and belief of ordinary people. It's awfully easy to do church history concentrating on bishops, popes, rulers, those are the people we are most clearly uh, informed about, but he has shown us how vital it is to get back to the laity, their feelings, their experience. And so what Professor Duffy has written is a lesson for all of us in many other areas of, um, of Christian life and history. Now, this huge respect for ordinary people and how they cope with life was also shown by Professor Duffy when we had him in at Heathrop to act as external examiner for church history degrees, the MTH and also doctorates, where his concern was not simply to maintain academic standards, which is what external examiners are called in to do, but he showed a real understanding of the position of part-time students doing further study in this area in a way that did not help their careers in any way, but simply out of a deep personal interest. And he was very clear speaking to me on this, because I tended to be a bit strict, that one has to take into account the difficulties people face, their courage in persevering. And he saw his job as giving them massive encouragement uh, and not simply ass assessing their work and bestowing marks. Now, I've been told I'm to speak briefly, so I'll just mention one final thing. Um, re recently reading Professor Duffy's book on Queen Mary, The Fires of the Faith, 
And Strauss how very definite he is, where he knows the facts and other people don't in putting them right. But in many areas of church history, where he's aware there's a justifiably variety of views, he is very open to disagreement. Some years ago, he gave a program of talks on the radio about the great popes of the past, including a talk about Leo the Great in the fifth century, and his supposedly major work, The Tome of Leo, which is generally said by Western historians to have solved the Christological controversy. Now, he knew that my view was very different, that I think this document was ill-informed, a contribution to rhetoric, not theology, um, disastrously worded. The Eastern emperors found they had to impose it on the church, and it is that that led to the schism that is still with us between the Byzantine and the Oriental Orthodox. So, but... Professor Duffy asked the BBC to interview me to supplement his presentation. Well, I was quite embarrassed by this. Could I really say what I thought? So I think I spoke rather indeterminately, and I doubt that what I said was broadcast. When I next saw Eamon, I asked him, why did you ask the BBC to interview me? He said, because I knew you disagreed with me, and I wanted you to say that. Now, that surely is a great lesson to us all in encouraging open debate, discussion, not merely in, in university seminars, but even in the medium, popular medium, of the BBC. Um, well, that is the way, of course, which our studies, our thought has to progress, through frank, open debate. It is through that that walking together, step by step, we are able to advance towards the perfect fullness of the truth, that, of course, we shall never attain. Therefore, Vice-Chancellor, it is with pride that I request you, on the authority of the governing body of Heathrop College, to admit Eamon Duffy to the degree of Doctor of Divinity of the University of London, Honoris Causa. now move to the awarding of the second honorary degree and I call upon Mr. Michael Egan. Janet Graffius is, creator of, is curator of collections and historic libraries at Stonyhurst College, Lancashire. She is a fellow of the Society of Antiquaries and an advisory board member for the British Jesuit Archives. Her publications include the illustrated history of the life of St. Ignatius and in conjunction with Stonyhurst students the Rosary Illustrated Through Illuminated Manuscripts. Her curated exhibitions include The Life and Legacy of St Thomas More, held in Washington DC in 2016, Jesuit Education in saint Omer, held there in 2017, and Martyr's Memory and Mission, the Venerable English College, held there earlier this year. Vice-Chancellor. Between March 1977 and November 1989, 16 and more Catholic men and women, priests and religious, missionaries and people associated with them were murdered in El Salvador, some of them by the El Salvador National Guard. Among them was Archbishop Oscar Romero, who was assassinated as he was celebrating Mass. For over 10 years, Jan Graffius has been a trustee and the conservation advisor to the Archbishop Romero Trust. In a wholly voluntary capacity, she has made nine week-long visits to El Salvador and has been deeply involved in the care and preservation of the vestments and possessions of Oscar Romero, the assassinated father Rutilio Grande, SJ, and the Jesuit martyrs. Archbishop Romero's relics are displayed in his former home at the Divine Providence Cancer Hospital. They are cared for there by the Carmelite Sisters and visited by many thousands of pilgrims from all over the world. Jan found that many items were at risk of irreparable damage due to excessive heat, humidity, artificial lighting, mould and insect infestation. Jan rescued the clothing in which the Archbishop was killed. 
She drew up a detailed conservation programme, made recommendations for environmental improvements and controls, trained the sisters in the fundamentals of conservation and established daily routines for them to follow. She completed a comprehensive illustrated inventory and history and helped the sisters apply for legal protection of the relics in the event of arbitrary attempts by the government and indeed the archdiocese to remove items. Over time, these displays have been transformed. Their care and maintenance are now sustainable by the sisters with Jan's guidance from a distance. At the Central American University in El Salvador, the possessions of Father Rutilio Grande and of the Jesuit martyrs who were killed there on campus in 1989 are displayed in a Hall of the Martyrs. Jan determined that display cases and other physical structures were insecure and needed replacement. Damage was being caused by heat, ultraviolet radiation, woodworm, termite and inf insect infestation. After several days spent inspecting the items and long consultation with the Jesuit community, she wrote a comprehensive conservation report for these relics also with recommendations and drawings for a complete redesign of the room and the displays. Father John Sabrino, SJ, a colleague of the murdered Jesuits, has expressed his gratitude to Jan for her wisdom and dedicated help in this transformation. Following the Catholic devotional practice of honouring relics of saints in different parts of the world, Jan has helped to make it possible for pieces of Oscar Romero's mass vestments to be placed in Southwark Cathedral, Stonyhurst College, in Edinburgh, and in the Church of San Pedro Claver in Cartagena, Colombia. Jan has also made a significant contribution to education about Romero and the Salvadoran martyrs. She has been interviewed about the conservation of Archbishop Romero's relics by the BBC, by US television and Vatican Radio. She delivered the Archbishop Romero Memorial Lecture in 2012 and in 2016 gave a major presentation at Lambeth Palace in the presence of the Archbishop of Canterbury and Cardinal Vincent Nichols on Thomas Beckett and Oscar Romero. Archbishop Oscar Romero was formally declared a saint by Pope Francis on the 14th of October of this year. In life, he was known as the voice of the voiceless poor. In death, he has become the named of the nameless martyrs. Thanks largely to the professional expertise and personal dedication of Jan Graffius, the Salvadoran martyrs are now, relics are now preserved for future generations. Vice Chancellor, I request you, on the authority of the governing body of Heathrock College, to admit Janet Graffius to the degree of Doctor of Divinity honoris causa. We now move to awarding the third honorary degree, and I call upon Professor Michael Barnes. Vice Chancellor, distinguished colleagues, graduates, guests, I present Brian Pitts, OBE. I first met Brian at the Cavendish Square, Heathrop, back in the mid-1980s. I wasn't sure what to expect. I had a telephone call about something which he thought might interest me, and an imposing presence arrived in my tiny office. Brian does presents. He wanted to discuss setting up an organisation that would link together the various interfaith organisations in the country. Brian was at the time 
one of Her Majesty's civil servants at the Treasury. And as he put it to me the other day, looking for something useful to do. <laughs> so he took a year's sabbatical, which morphed into two, until it became clear that working to promote understanding, cooperation and good relations between different faiths in the UK gave him more energy than pondering over the nation's finances. And so it was that the Interfaith Network began. The Interfaith Network now includes national bodies like the Board of Deputies of British Jews and the Zoroastrian Trust Funds, as well as local interfaith forums and faith-based agencies like Westminster Interfaith, a Catholic agency which I ran for a few years. It has grown into the one, of the most of the, one of the most important forces for community cohesion in the country and the source of an enormous amount of wisdom about the place of religion in civic society. Not the least reason for the success of the network was Brian's ever-competent, reassuring leadership. He was director, founder director, for some 20 years, stepping down in 2007 to become its advisor on faith and public life. Brian is possessed of the extraordinary skill of the civil servant, always ready with the right word at the right time, knowledgeable, reliable, trusted by everyone for his objectivity and clarity of thought. I have always admired the way that Brian manages to keep unsteady chairs and unruly speakers on side without ever, it appears, upsetting anyone. I'll give you one example. I remember being present at intense discussions run by the network in the wake of the Rushdie affair in the early 90s. Muslims thought that they would be protected under the law of blasphemy, but it turned out that the law originated in the Elizabethan period and only covered blasphemy against the Church of England, attacks by perfidious Catholics. I shall never forget how Brian, a gentle, urbane Anglican, deeply sensitive to the injustice of it all, somehow managed to produce the perfect minute, the perfect report, which accurately reflected both the facts and the feelings, and they were considerable, expressed at the meeting. Vice-Chancellor, I don't want to give the impression that Brian is no more than an emollient interfaith Sir Humphrey on the lookout for bright ideas that are getting out of hand and stopping them. Brian has a hinterland of his own, and he's also a thoughtful religious communicator in his own right. More than a decade ago, I can remember another telephone call and a conversation about religious belief and atheism. Brian was thinking, as always, of the next step. And so he moved into a different network. The conversations facilitated at Heathrop by Fiona Ellis and the Centre for Philosophy of Religion. Brian soon became a constant and active presence at our seminars, and he still is at our new incarnation at Roehampton University. Brian was also instrumental in producing a book co-edited by Tony Carroll called Religion and Atheism, Beyond the Divide. Brian wrote the foreword, a masterly review of the genesis of the book in wide-ranging conversations about the place of religion in the public square. And in a very few hundred words, he distills good sense and wisdom, raising the key questions that should occupy philosophers of religion, theologians, and even interfaith bods like myself about the immediate future. Vice-Chancellor, as a civil servant, Brian Pierce worked for five different government departments, four of which, he says, he managed to close. <laughs> the Treasury remains. At least it did this morning. 
That, however, is not the reason he is here today as Heathrop College's last honorary doctor. We honour him for his personal contribution for 20 years as a brilliant facilitator at the heart of serious debate about religion in the public arena, and also for his more recent work as a persistent yet ever courteous scourge of the new atheism. Vice-Chancellor, I request you, on the authority of the governing body of Heathrop College, to admit Brian Pierce to the degree of Doctor of Divinity Honoris Causa. I now call upon Professor Eamon Duffy to respond on behalf of all the honorary graduates and fellows. Vice Chancellor, Principal, Governors. It's a privilege to have been fingered to speak on behalf of my fellow <coughs> graduates and to thank the college for the honor they've done us in conferring these degrees. Graduations are celebrations, the happy recognition of tasks well completed and crowned, if not with laurels, at least with hoods and silly hats. <laughs> there are look backwards on tasks successfully completed and forward to the work which the tasks were designed to enable. And it really is an honor to join the graduates of a college which for 50 years has been providing generations of men and women with a first-rate formation in philosophy, theology, and related disciplines. Many of those taking those courses came to Heathrop as mature students, and they brought that maturity to bear on their study. So this place has provided a unique theological formation which has enriched both the church and the wider society. We've heard already that many uh, Heathrop graduates go into disciplines where they are in contact with people, uh, not into uh, abstraction. But as everybody here knows, the happiness of today's celebration is qualified by awareness that we're participating in the last formal act of this college, the end of a venture which was shaped by the ecclesial vision of the Second Vatican Council. The decision of the Society of Jesus to move Heathrop from rural seclusion into the heart of London marked what was for the English Catholic community a quite new kind of openness to and engagement with the society around it. It's genuinely tragic that with Heathrop's closure, the church in this country has lost, though it would be more accurate to say has thrown away, a unique resource. I salute those like Michael Holman and I commiserate with them uh, who worked for uh, a happier outcome. Four centuries ago, Heathrop's first students were prepared in exile for a future that took many of them to lives of concealment and hardship <coughs> for the sake of conscience and some to a hideous death at the hands of the hangman. The job of the college in those days was to preserve the deposit by educating lay people barred by their religion from education in schools and colleges in England and by forming priests to minister to a persecuted community. Heathrop has gone on preparing Jesuits for ministry 
But over the last 50 years, the intellectual apostolate of the college has widened, and the achievements of the other two of my fellow honorants reflect the spirit of Heathrop in these 50 years. Jan Graffius's work in propagating the memory of St. Oscar Romero embodies an understanding of the gospel as addressed prophetically to situations wherever people are oppressed by poverty and tyranny. Brian Pierce's work for interreligious understanding, like Heathrop's own consistent promotion of interfaith study and teaching, has never seemed more urgently necessary in a world where contending and mutually uncomprehending fundamentalisms, both secular and sacred, have added and go on adding to the sum of human misery. But it would be wrong to mar this occasion by ending on a pessimistic note. Every teacher knows that the real business of any educational institution <coughs> properly begins when its students leave it behind. Throughout its existence, Heathrop has been, among other things, a seminary. And that word means a seedbed. Over the last 50 years in particular, Heathrop has been sowing in bright, receptive minds the seeds of a faith that not only is unafraid of, but which is informed by concern for truth, for clarity, and intellectual integrity. It's up to you, the last graduates of Heathrop, to ensure that those seeds go on bearing fruit 50-fold, 100-fold, long after the luxury flats in Heathrop's buildings have begun to look shabby. <laughs> and we, aging on around, are just fading memories in dim photographs. That concludes the awarding of the honorary degrees and I call upon Mrs. Tamsin Eastwood, Chair of Governors, to give the vote of thanks and to close the proceedings. <coughs> Vice Chancellor, ladies and gentlemen, we are not quite ready to close the proceedings yet and I would like to call on the Reverend Dr. Peter Gallagher, SJ, to say a few words. <coughs> Vice-Chancellor, Chair of Governors, ladies and gentlemen, almost the last word comes from St. John Bosco, who said that without love, there can be no true education. We've been honoring all afternoon the love of wisdom and the cherishing of human beings, which has characterized the life of Heathrop College. An important part of the educative love which has been demonstrated at Heathrop has been in its administrative support where there has been exceptional generosity and exceptional understanding of our mission. Discreetly, industriously and intelligently has been done everything that sustains the educational endeavour. Administration, human resources, finance, student support, IT, and all the planning, organizing, reporting, monitoring, and archiving, these have also been done with love. And ceremony planned with love. This love has been a careful attention to all the ways in which Heathrop has needed to flourish in the university, including the relationship between us and the communities around us, with all their hopes and expectations of us. And the personification of all this loving service is someone who, at one time or another, has astonishingly done or supervised all the particular tasks. Annabel Clarkson has been the heart of Heathrop. Her present youthfulness and energy 
might make us forget the extent of what she has given to us, the work she has done for us, the time. Her contribution to Heathrop's education with love has included care for students and staff, respect for all and for their situation, special attention to those in any kind of difficulty. As we look today towards the future, Heathrop prizes especially memory. There are so many wonderful persons and times and truths to remember. And Annabelle is the memory of Heathrop. She recalls us all and fondly. She remembers all the good things that have happened, all the good that has been spoken. And Annabelle remembers God. Her spiritual inspiration is Salesian. Everything is for the glory of the one who made us and seeks the best for us. The Jesuits of the British province honor in Annabelle a kindred spirit, teaching and inspiring us. The Campion Medal is our highest award. Its name speaks of excellence, of self-sacrifice, of love, and of witness to the truth far beyond the ordinary. Annabelle has understood Heathrop College and what it intended to be and to do. She has given her life to it. I request the President of the College, Father Provincial Damien Howard, to confer on Annabelle Clarkson the Campion Medal Amoris Causa. Mrs. Tamsin Eastwood to give the vote of thanks and to close proceedings. Thank you, Peter. On behalf of my fellow governors and the holders of long service awards, Father Michael Barnes, Miss Annabel Clarkson, Father Peter Gallagher, I thank you for the fellowships with which you have kindly honoured us. It is at this point that I want to quote something from a graduation speak, speech by Charlie Day, the actor. I did contemplate trying to pass it off as my own witticism, but with a room full of academics always alert to plagiarism, I thought better of it. <laughs> now, I know that having an honorary fellowship will do nothing for me, but I'm here to tell you today that your degrees, the ones you toil to get, the ones you actually took classes to earn. Those degrees will basically do nothing. Let me clarify. You can't exchange your degree for cash. You can't give a degree or get a degree to audition for you or to interview for you. You can't eat it. Please don't make love to it. You can maybe smoke it, but I wouldn't advise it. Back to reality. When I first had the honour of standing here, I was full of awe at the achievements of those then assembled. That sense of awe has in no way diminished. In fact, it has grown. On a wide spectrum, and what we have heard today endorses it, what has been achieved by all those involved with Heathrop College and Heathrop before the college during the last 450 years is awesome. But what has been achieved in the last few years is truly impressive. My congratulations to all those graduating and receiving awards and honours today. I would like also to say thank you to you, to you all. Thank you for your continued faith and confidence in Heathrop. Thank you for continuing 
or to choosing to study here or to continue your studies here, despite our circumstances. That faith and confidence has not been misplaced. And that is testimony to the whole team that is Heathrop College and to whom I would like to give my personal thanks. There are many constituent parts to Heathrop, but the students must be the mainstay. Without them, there would be no college. So thank you. To the Society of Jesus, who founded and supported the college for so long, who provided inspiration, ethos, manpower, leadership, as well as financial resource. Thank you. Vice-Chancellor, thank you for your words, challenging and encouraging. Thank you for your support today and for the use of the beautiful building. Thank you. To all those others at the University of London, who particularly in the last few years have been constructive in their concern to ensure that the student experience was protected during the teach out. Thank you. To all the staff at Heathrop who have been quite extraordinary, that the standards, which were already extremely high, have not only been maintained but have been exceeded time and time again across all the disciplines of the college, that that fact is amazing. Not just the academic teaching and research, but also in the systems, the reports, the management. Not once did any eye come any, off any ball. Many were being juggled at the time, but not one has been allowed to drop. Thank you to the senior leadership team, the academics, the professional and the support staff. My true heartfelt thanks. To our principal, Professor Azan, who had the courage to join us when she did and who has led us with a light but firm touch. Thank you. To Roehampton, who have been so supportive and shared Professor Azan with us for the last two years. Thank you. And to my fellow governors, you are, ladies and gentlemen, a great team and one from whom I have learned much and with whom I have thoroughly enjoyed working. Thank you. It is funny, isn't it, how things occur? I've been cogitating how on earth I conclude and finish, follow all the eminent speakers that we've heard today. Frankly, I was making little progress, but then I was rewarded by going to, when I went to Mass on Sunday. The topic for the sermon was dead ends. Ah, I thought, I've come across one of those. Father Stephen Pepper, who it was who was speaking, spoke of how the word of God is not foreign to dead ends, but if anything, directs itself to them and comes alive. How often do we find ourselves in a situation we really did not want to be in and which appears to be the end of the road? Only to find that just being in that situation makes us address the particular impasse or gridlock to develop new ideas, to find another route, to go on to achieve even bigger things never previously considered. The other problem that Father Stephen um, solved for me on Sunday was to tell me about a Roman map or a map of the Roman roads that you can download. It's been designed as a tube map. It's rather fun. What that demonstrates is all roads go to Rome. Our roads are different. Our roads emanate from Heathrop. There are many that lead from here, and there are many more that I have no doubt will be paved. The closure of the college is an apparent dead end, but I have confidence in the future, and that the new work that will come from the college that we have known and loved. The legacy of Heathrop will take many forms. We've heard of a number today. This will only grow. New strands will be developed, built on all that has been achieved before. But it starts 
with the students who are collecting their well-deserved honours and awards today. You are the vanguard of our legacy, and we are proud that it should be so. Ladies and gentlemen, that does conclude the proceedings. I now formally close the 2018 graduation ceremony for the Heathrock College here in London and invite you all to this reception to celebrate your success. <laughs>